Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news podcast. And please don't forget, there's a donate button at the top of the webpage. Over the years, Republican cries about the evils of big deficits have been more rhetorical than real. That is, as long as the deficit came as a result of tax cuts and not social programs that benefited working people. Biden takes the reins of the federal government at a time when most of Wall Street has embraced the need for more stimulus and shows little to no concern about the size of the deficit. So why is Wall Street so on board with more stimulus? And given the change of mood of the financial sector and the historically low inflation rates, is the plan announced by Biden going far enough? And once the economy is recovering, will Biden succumb to pressure from austerity hawks and move towards a more balanced budget? And how will Biden achieve his goal of making the U.S. power grid carbon neutral by 2035? Is he planning to phase out fossil fuel or is he depending on carbon capture, which is still unproven technology? We're going to talk about all of this with our guest who's now joining us, Bob Polin. He's the co-founder of Perry, the Political Economy Research Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts, and co-author of a book with Noam Chomsky titled Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, The Political Economy of Saving the Planet. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Thanks very much for having me, Paul. So let's start with this change of mood. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago when the predominant majority voices on Wall Street, certainly expressed through the leadership of the Republican Party, and many of the Democrats, was all about austerity. Uh, and and if, even at times, if they accepted a certain amount of stimulus, uh, you know, when there was recession, uh, but it didn't take long before the austerity hawks were back yelling again. Uh, but there seems to be a real change of mind about this on Wall Street. What is that about? I would say, in the first instance, the people on Wall Street recognize the magnitude of the crisis, uh, which is historic, and they don't want to go down. Now, what's happened over the last nine months since co the COVID pandemic started? Um, the U.S. economy uh, has experienced this massive recession. Uh, if you look at over the last nine months, 45% of the workforce, 78 million people have filed for unemployment insurance. If you look at basic indicators, which I was just looking at, almost 20% of households with children uh, the, in the last week have uh, faced food insecurity, don't have enough to eat. Uh, another 20% say they can't afford their rent. Uh, that's from the real side of the economy. Now, on the financial side of the economy, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average from uh, March until today is up almost 70 percent. This is, again, this is truly unprecedented that the real economy is experiencing severe suffering, but Wall Street is doing great. And why is Wall Street doing great? Well, because in March, we passed the uh, this initial stimulus program, the CARES Act, C-A-R-E-S Act, uh, which was about 10% of GDP, a deficit in expansion. On top of that, the Federal Reserve began uh, buying up bonds from Wall Street to keep them afloat, to get money in their pockets. Uh, to date, they've bought up um, about three and a half, about three trillion in bonds. So that's 14% of GDP pumped into Wall Street directly. So what are they, you know, they're happy about it. They're doing very well. So the deficit is really not the big problem for them. The problem for them is to keep the stock prices going up. And that's happened under this extraordinary expansion that's uh, expansionary policy that's taken place in the previous nine months. The uh, increase in asset prices, the stock market, had a lot to do with the Fed directly buying debt. And, and I believe they even bought certain stocks. They bought into index. Uh, uh, they loaned money to corporations. Uh, the defense of the assets seemed to be as much or even more 
of the previous stimulus package then actually went into the pockets of working people. Now, this stimulus, if I'm correct, seems to be actually more focused on getting money into people to increase demand in the economy. And Wall Street seems to be quite happy with that as well now. Well, okay, so the so we just also passed the in December, just uh, a month ago, we passed the second stimulus program that was nine hundred billion, um, which was one one third of what the House Democrats passed in May, the Heroes Act that never got enacted under Trump. So uh, the 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 proposal under Biden that he put out, you know, just a couple of days ago pretty much um, coincides with the magnitude, the size of the HEROES Act. If you add up what happened, what passed in December, and then what Biden is proposing, another $1.9 trillion, which would give, you know, would give people a, uh, another $1,400 check on top of the $600 that got passed in December. It would give unemployed workers another $400 a week on top of the 300 that got passed in December. So it more or less, the, the Biden proposal brings us uh, back to more or less what passed in the House uh, in May. And it has these critical features. It does include spending to support state and local governments that are looking at half a trillion dollars of deficits in the next several months if they don't get some kind of support. It gives a few hundred uh, uh, billion for um, COVID relief, you know, public health support, and that's critical. And the other big thing is um, it uh, extends the the child care uh, tax credit. So for working families with children, it's giving them support. So on all of those, yeah, it's it's not focused on Wall Street this time. There isn't anything in it, for example in terms of support for uh, businesses. Now, is the Fed continuing its support for the stock market? These are quite separate things then? So the Fed, uh, the Fed bond buying, you know, you never know because the Fed, the Fed bond buying, they just do it. They don't really, they're not under public scrutiny. Almost nobody even knows what they're doing or understands what they're doing. But, uh, you know, having just checked it, so it is the you know the Fed uh, has bought about uh, three trillion in nine months, and which was a seventy eight percent increase uh, in nine months relative to where they were relative to the floor that they were at. They so bought three. They the, bought three trillion of what? Three trillion of corporate bonds uh, of uh, of you, yeah. For example, you said index bonds. Uh, so basically just Wall Street paper. They bought that. Um, they were uh, empowered under the March stimulus to lend, also directly lend. Uh, and that that lending program actually really never got that big. Uh, they never even reached the point at which they were legally uh, permitted to go. But that was relatively small. So there's been press about the fact, why didn't the Fed uh, meet its uh, it, its lending levels to support the uh, business uh, when, in fact, uh, what the Fed really did was buy $3 trillion, that's 14% of GDP, 14% of GDP they bought just in the last nine months. Again, this is absolutely without historic precedent. The uh, a significant amount, if, if I'm understanding all this correctly, of the government debt that's increasing with these stimulus programs, are they not borrowing a large chunk of it actually from the Fed? Well, that's the other thing. So that well, the Fed always their day to day operation is buying and selling government bonds. That's that's what they do. So, yes, I mean, the Fed could buy all of the uh, government bonds. And therefore, we have a deficit increase, but then the deficit just goes away because the Fed buys the bonds, the Fed owns the bonds, and nobody has to pay anybody. That's printing money, effectively. And the Fed does that all the time. That's what they do. It's just the level at which they do it. So, uh, yeah, so we're not, we don't really have to worry too much 
about the deficit getting uh, blowing up. I, I would say we have to worry about it a little bit, not now, maybe in three years we do, but not, not a lot, especially because the interest rate at which the U.S. government is borrowing is, you know, a half of 1%. So, you know, you, you can borrow a trillion dollars, but if you don't have to pay any interest, you just keep rolling over the debt and you, it doesn't affect your budget at all. And if you're borrowing it and paying interest to the Fed, a large part, then you're just borrowing yeah. it from yourself. Like it's all a bunch That's of right. dig, digits right. moving back and forth on computers. So That's in some right. ways, it comes down to a confidence game in a sense that you can push this as far as global capital maintains confidence in the American dollar. And I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, all the American dollar, they're going to, maybe people are going to lose confidence in it, but what the hell is the alternative? It's, it's like the whole global capitalist system is based on this. If people start losing confidence in the American dollar, it throws everything up in the air. Right. So the U S is unique as this unique situation. Uh, just like what happened in the last crisis with the financial crisis 2009, and the, the borrowing then was massive, uh, historically high. And they, at, at that point, unlike now, there were these, you know, choruses of the big, big time economists, orthodox economists, the deficit hawks, as you referred to, saying this is this is going to be a disaster. Uh, people lose confidence in the dollar. And actually, what really happened was just the opposite. Because you're in a crisis, well, okay, we don't like the U.S. dollar, but then what do we like? Uh, there really wasn't an alternative then, and so what actually happened was that the buying of the government bonds increased the U.S. government bonds. That that was the safest asset on the global financial market, and it remains the safest asset on the global financial market because the dollar is the uh, is the global currency. So that is this advantage we call seniorage that the U.S. Uh, is able to work with that no other country can enjoy, even in Europe, even the European Central. Yeah, I remember in 07, 08, the, the number of predictions of the d- decline and collapse of the American dollar and buy gold. And I remember one prediction even had the United States breaking up and having separate currencies in different parts of the country. And what actually happened? The whole world bought U.S. dollars. Yeah. And so that's where we are now. Yeah. I mean, you know, it it wasn't just like crazy people saying, you know, uh, let's break up the U.S. It was, you know, the leading orthodox macroeconomists were saying, uh, yeah, this is going to be a disaster. This was 2009. Uh, What's going to happen is going to be massive inflation, massive increase in interest rates. And then the U.S. government is going to face bankruptcy. Uh, This was the famous uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff paper saying, you know, that it would it would lead to collapse of economic growth. None of those things happened. And that has in turn uh, led to kind of a much more relaxed attitude towards deficits in general at the moment. On top of the fact that we have such a huge crisis. it's a good thing the government is spending because e- even at the level of suffering people are experiencing, not Wall Street, everybody else, uh, it would be much worse if we weren't doing this deficit spending. So th- so then I'm left with the question, if, if you have an out-of-control pandemic, and at least for at least four, five, six months, maybe more, who knows when the vaccine actually starts to slow this thing down? And and it's it seems to me, just listening to everything, that there's far more capacity in terms of the deficit. Why aren't isn't there a lockdown, a national lockdown, and pay everybody to stay home? Like give do you know the, the form where you give the money to the businesses to pay all their workers to stay home at the same rate they were being paid before. People that don't have jobs get actual living wages to stay home. And you lock the place down until the pandemic is over rather than tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands more deaths. So in that context, it seems to be the Biden plan, which looks good compared to what the Republicans were pushing, you know, just a few weeks ago when they controlled the Senate, 
it seems way conservative for what's actually needed. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the fourteen hundred dollars, for example, that there it's in the Biden plan, which will tack on to the six hundred dollars that's already passed. So you get two thousand dollars. Okay, that'll cover two months rent, maybe, but that's then it's over. Uh, what we should have is, you know, whatever, two thousand dollars a month until this is done. Uh, the unemployment insurance. I mean, obviously, a lot of people do still need to work. But then, yeah, you know, the people working in in grocery stores and supermarkets, people working in hospitals, and then, you know, over half of the people in the upper income brackets are working online, uh, pretty much okay. So that can continue, but other everyone else, yeah, we should. I mean the 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 amount uh, the the four hundred dollars supplement that Biden has is worthwhile. It's it'll help, um, but uh, it you know it, it's not going to last forever. We've got to keep it going until the pandemic is done, and the six hundred dollars total that was uh, in the previous stimulus was giving people their f full income, people up to say $35,000 a year, was giving them their full income while they were unemployed. So that's a reasonable level. Uh, and it's not just smoke and mirrors that, you know, the Fed owns some of the debt and, you know, people just have no choice but to believe in the US dollar and so on. There's real wealth in the United States. I saw, uh, that to back all this up, I saw a study by, I think it was Brookings Institute, which did an, an analysis of how much wealth assets are there in private hands out, after debt, actual assets after debt. And it was $98 trillion. And that's a, yep. that's a ridiculous amount of money in private hands that at least in theory you could tax if you had to. Well, that's, I mean, look, the, 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 the Biden program, which, you know, I think is, it should pass. I hope it passes and it'll get us for through a new, another few months. Uh, it, it doesn't say anything about spending for climate change or anything for infrastructure uh, at all. Uh, it doesn't say anything about expanding public health beyond a few months at all. So all of these things have to also be tacked on. And Biden has talked about uh, another program. And uh, that one is supposedly is coming next. Now, how how do we pay for that one? Well, I think we have to start taxing uh, high income people. A wealth tax is a very simple way to do it. Um, we can also tax Wall Street transactions, which is something that has been proposed by Bernie Sanders, you know, six seven years ago. Uh, there's been a there's been a bill that was introduced in the House eight years ago. Uh, I myself helped draft it. Uh, it was by uh, then Congressman Keith Ellison, and Bernie picked it up. That would raise another three hundred uh, billion a year. Uh, so, yeah, those are ways to uh, advance a, an egalitarian, a green agenda, and it doesn't all have to be on deficits. Uh, wealthy people should just pay more taxes. I mean. Look, the average return on a high income asset is about 7%. Um, so if you had a 2% wealth tax, that would pay for the whole program, uh, a, a serious green agenda, for example. Um, then, okay, so then the wealthy people have a return of 5%. Like they're already really rich and they're going to get 5% richer a year as opposed to 7% richer a year. That's what we're talking about here. And in, and in fact, that 7% is an average, but the top one half of no, one of course, percentile has been way, doing yeah. way more, way more. Than oh, yeah. Well, of course, uh, yeah, Elon Musk, uh, he went from whatever, $3 billion to $150 billion in the last year. So he certainly benefited from all the talk about a green economy. I think there's another thing that doesn't get enough attention is the pushback from Republicans, and one of the people who's been most outspoken about this is Lindsey Graham, push back on uh, a, a program that pays people uh, subsidies while they're at home. His big objection was that 
people were getting paid more than they were earning when they went to work. And, and that the lack of that discipline of the working class, which means the desperation of the working class, to work for such crappy wages that if you stay home and you can get your 600 bucks a week and you go to work and you're only making 400, why are you ever going to go back and work for 400? Well, that's the point. Why the hell should you be working for 400? But, but that whole logic is, is infected or has pressured, I think, on why they want to lower these uh, weekly subsidy amounts because they're buying into the list logic that you, you, got it. you can't let the sections of the working class willing to work for poverty wages to get a taste of what it's like not to have poverty wages. Yeah, well, that's certainly been an argument forever. Uh, that's been an argument, let's say, forever, as long as there's been any ideas about any kind of social welfare program. The, uh, the argument against it is, well, then people won't have any incentive to show up at work. And, you know, there's there, you know, there's a massive literature uh, focused mainly of, around Europe where they have more generous welfare states to say, well, this is the cause of uh, long term unemployment because we're giving people too much money. Uh, their unemployment benefits, they're too they're too generous. And so people say, why should I bother to go back to work? Well, there's actually been uh, some very important work which completely refuted all that literature, including from uh, a good friend of mine, a former graduate school classmate named David Howell, uh, who looked at, because it's a very easy comparison. He did a lot of work, but the simple comparison is, if you look at the unemployment rates, for example, in Sweden, uh, which has like, even, even now, even though their welfare state has been uh, greatly diminished, it's still the most generous uh, relative to the U.S., if you look at Sweden's unemployment experience versus the U.S., uh, Sweden does better. So you can't say that the mere fact that they have a generous welfare state is causing people to stay home. Uh, people will show up at work. If you give them decent wages, uh, they will show up. If you give them really lousy wages and no benefits, sure, they will go to work out of desperation. I mean, I know... Uh, I experienced this when I was doing work way back in Bolivia and uh, where they had no welfare state. And the uh, the government economists said, well, we don't have any unemployment. I said, well, what about all the people in the street begging? He, they, he said, well, they're working, aren't they? They're not unemployed. They they're earning it. They're earning an income. <laughs> they were, were technically they were right. I said, well, that's yeah, that's right. They're desperate. So if somebody is desperate, they will mostly people will try to stay alive. That's not the kind of society that we would call minimally decent. So that yeah, that perspective has been there. Lindsey Graham is by no means original. The uh, when I look at the ratings of countries' uh, levels of productivity, those Nordic countries that have the most of uh, the strongest social safety nets are almost always in the top ten countries of productivity That's in the right. world. They're high they're higher productivity, they have better welfare state. Yeah, the tax rate, you know, tax is a share of GDP is about half the economy. But they have generous welfare states. People show up at work, they're more productive because they're getting paid more. They you're a different worker. I mean I, I you know we've studied this also in, in the US with respect to living wages. When you pay people the higher, say fifteen dollar minimum wage, they will be more motivated. Absenteeism goes down, turnover goes down. So you say that businesses save money by reduced absenteeism and turnover because you have a higher productivity worker. Uh, let's go back to what Biden's proposing. Who's covered by the fifteen dollar minimum wage, and when and how does it kick in? Well, it has to pass, uh, but. Um, yeah, I have, uh, you know, I would say it's going to you know, directly affect people who are under 15. That's going to be about 15, 20 percent of the workforce. But then you also get the so-called ripple effect benefits, wherein people who not just at 15, but people when when the people below 15 get up to 15, the people who are at 15 and above, they will get uh, some wage increases as well just in order to uh, keep them compensated at 
the higher levels than the lowest paid workers. So, you know, I the, the work I've done, uh, not in the last couple of years, but before that, you're looking at about 35 to 40 percent of the workforce is going to get some raise. Uh, and I think that, you know, that is what we would look at, um, mostly affecting the lowest paid workers, but all the way up to 30 to 40 percent. Do we know how it's implemented? Like, is this a phase in over five years or is it going to happen quickly? Oh, uh, I don't know what his proposal is. I don't, he hasn't he hasn't put it down yet. Yeah, I haven't seen any detail. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, of course, the supporters of the 15 fight for 15 have been at it for several years. So at this point, today's 15 was not the 15 of five, six years ago. Uh, so, I mean, to get it passed would still be a major achievement, but it should be phased in quickly. And, you know, the work that I did on this, I don't know, three, four years ago, we looked at we looked at just like the fast food industry who will be most impacted. Uh, and the fast food industry, we said, well, businesses can cover this with, you know, very modest uh, price increases, uh, like a Big Mac. Uh, the price increase would have to go up, you know, 10%, like from a, a $4 Big Mac to $4.50, and you cover 50% of all the costs of uh, of of the fifteen dollar minimum wage, I know in Baltimore, uh, fifteen dollars, and this is two three years ago, was kind of a living wage for a single person. Add one kid, and it's not even close. Uh, I think it was a parent with two kids. It was at least twenty something an hour. And uh, and even that is just barely getting by. So uh, this idea that somehow fifteen dollars, while it's something compared to what it is, it's it's no great big windfall for anybody. No, I mean you know if you look at very there's these various living standard indicators. Economic Policy Institute does it. Uh, there's a group at MIT that does these living standard indicators. So if you look at, for example where I live uh, in our area, what they say is for, you know, a, a, say a single parent and one kid to be at a, you know, a, a decent living standard. And they go through in terms of paying for groceries, paying for rent. You're looking at, you know, $55,000 a year or something like that. $50,000 a year, we can argue over it. But the point is, if you're at $15 an hour, and that's one income, and it's the whole year, that's $30,000 a year. And so that's 20000 less than fifty. Uh, so that's not even close uh, to a living wage in, uh, you know, an average community such as the one I live in. Okay, let's go back to this issue of deficits and, all, deficits and such. There's progressive economists and others who argue, now that you got Wall Street finally willing to accept these big deficits. Why take on the political battle of a wealth tax or even uh, increased taxation uh, when, when you may not have the forces to win such? So why not just keep the deficit stuff going and worry about the taxation far down the road? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a reasonable position uh, for the moment. And I do not think we should raise taxes in any way, shape, or form in the next year, say. Uh, but you know, once the let's let's hope the economy does recover, and let's hope we get to something approximate to full employment, or at least close to it, um, then we should, uh, you know, we should then start having rich people pay their fair share of taxes. It is a long-term, a much better long-term structural solution than having to assume that we can just keep borrowing indefinitely uh, for all purposes. We can borrow indefinitely in a crisis. I don't think it's a good idea to borrow indefinitely. Why? For everything. Uh, well, for one thing, if you get the economy to something close to full employment, um, then at that point, uh, you are going to be putting uh, pressure on the economy that could create inflation, uh, significant inflation, could. 
So we don't want that to happen. Secondly, uh, in terms of the distribution of income, I mean, ha- ha- hang you- on, hang on one sec, because if you start having an increase in inflation, interest rates go up, and that debt, which is now almost negligible in terms of how much interest you pay, you actually start paying much more serious interest on it. Yeah, probably not certainly. I mean, I, you know, the experience that we've been through the last ten years, and especially now demonstrates, I mean, the the macro economy is completely different. I mean, we're having this zero interest rate policy effectively, you know, for 10 years. We've never had that in history. I don't know that any country's ever had that in history. So this is totally new. The fact that we have, if you add up the deficit spending from uh, March, now December, and then if we add up Biden, that's 23% of GDP. Um, during, we've never had that. We had it in World War II, but we were fighting World War II. That's the only time we've had deficit spending at anywhere close to this magnitude. So this is new territory. And I think that, you know, it, it's it's good for now. But there, we have to recognize that, you know, it is new territory. And running an economy with a deficit, at, you know, 25% of GDP and zero interest rates is creating imbalances, whether we can live with these imbalances forever. uh, I don't know enough to say that for sure. And I think that we're much better off in terms of other things, in terms of just the distribution of income, to start forcing rich people to pay taxes like they did in the 1950s and 1960s, basically until Reagan. And it's part of the problem that there used to be this pressure periodically to get interest rates back up again, because there's a section of capital and people dependent on uh, interest income to get interest rates up so they can make more money on that capital. But now with low interest rates, they've created such a stock market bubble that maybe they don't need that, you know, but how sustainable is that that the stock market, you know, eventually reaches Mars. There's just got to be a point where that people start to wonder what what are these companies really worth? Yeah, I mean, the the you know, the, the ratio of the uh, stock market to the real economy, which is the Buffett index, Warren Buffett. So a lot of people think he's a really smart guy and he's you know, he created this index. So the the difference between the level of the stock market and the level of the real economy is so huge. Again, we're all at a historically unprecedented level. Maybe Warren Buffett doesn't know anything. Maybe people don't really care if companies make money. They just care about you know the asset price keep going up because they can't they can't buy bonds. Why would they buy a bond when there's no return on a bond? And that's what we're experiencing. It's probably not a good way to run an economy indefinitely. It's it's definitely not a good idea to have the stock market going up by 70 percent while people are going hungry, 20 uh, percent of the economy. So we want to change the distribution of income no matter what. And taxing rich people is an important way to do it. Uh, just finally, you know, Biden in his in the Oval Office, he hung this enormous uh, picture of FDR on the wall right across from him. So when he sits at his desk, he looks at this massive uh, painting of FDR. Um, What he's done so far is not yet New Deal proportions by any means. Um, But if this, as this crisis deepens, um, it seems to be something on that scale is what's needed. Uh, Do you see Biden and the kind of people he's appointed uh, being able to go there? Well, first of all, FDR wasn't FDR at first either. So, uh, you know, if Biden looks at the picture of FDR, you know, when FDR got elected, he was denouncing Hoover for running up big deficits and he was for a balanced budget. Uh, and then also, you know, in whatever, 1937, when the uh, the uh, depression got worse again, that was because they were trying to close the deficit in 1937. It wasn't until the war when, okay, you know, all bets are off. We don't care about the deficit. We're just going to spend and defeat Hitler. So uh, 
FDR had a very egalitarian program, but it really was not entirely founded on the idea that deficits don't matter. Um, that got relaxed mainly during the war. So, you know, uh, Biden, as we know, Biden was a corporate Democrat, and so is Kamala Harris. Uh, Kamala Harris, sorry. Uh, they're not, they're not uh, left oriented at all, uh, but the circumstances are extreme. And, you know, maybe what's happened, and maybe we on the left can give ourselves a bit of credit, is to, you know, force uh, people, at least some corporate type Democrats, to see reality and to respond in a, in a reasonable way. I would include uh, Janet Yellen as uh, a first case in point. I mean, she's a, always been kind of a, a, you know, liberal Democrat type. Uh, I think she's a genuinely uh, compassionate person. She she worked a lot around issues around labor markets and unemployment. And she's Treasury Secretary. I think she has an orthodox mindset in terms of uh, Wall Street. She was chair of the Fed, but uh, I think she's open minded. And I think she hopefully can be pushed in the right direction and we can sustain an egalitarian recovery. We shall see. Thanks very much for joining us, Bob. Okay. Thanks for having me, Paul. Thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast. And please don't forget the donate button at the top of the webpage. 